encouragement for you because we are looking at courage. Can you say courage? Courage, Courage, the willingness and ability to do something that frightens you or that comes with a cost or often has pain associated with it. Courage is absolutely vital because fear is everywhere in life and it's something that we face nearly every day of our lives. Fear of all kinds is a part of life and your success or your fruitfulness in life is often determined by how well we manage our fears. I mean, we know lots of common phobias, don't we? Here are some phobias that you will know very well. Arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. If you have one of these phobias, please feel free to put your hand up online or anywhere. Anyone fear spiders particularly? Anyone just loathe spiders? And you're like, God, creatures. No, no, no. I don't like spiders. Ophidiophobia is the fear of snakes. Oh, I can't. Oh, I can't even think about snakes without getting um, weird feelings. Claustrophobia, the fear of confined spaces. Glossophobia, the fear of speaking in public. And necrophobia, the fear of death. Apparently, the fear of public speaking is more common than the fear of death. And so, as Jerry Seinfeld puts it, if someone goes to a funeral, many of you will know this old joke. Most people would prefer to be in the coffin than giving the eulogy, if that is a true statistic. Um, What else? Where are we? So those are the most kind of common ones. Some ones you might not be aware of. Octophobia, the fear of the figure eight. Okay, don't come across on podophobia. I think that's how you say it. Fear of feet. Anyone got podophobia? We had someone in the first service. Scoptophobia, the fear of being stared at. <laughs> Some of you get nervous. <laughs> Phobophobia, the fear of phobias. Oof, that's a big one. And chronometrophobia, the fear of clocks. Hold on, this is this is my one joke for the day. Clock changes must have sent you spinning if that's your phobia. <laughs> I do apologize. That's it. There's no more. Hopefully the only way is up from here. There seem to be an endless number of phobias in life, let alone the daily fears and worries and anxieties we have. Handling fear and therefore having courage is absolutely vital to life, especially your life as a Christian, because from the outset, you are told that there is a cost to following Jesus, that there is a price to pay, that there will be persecutions and trials and difficulties. So how we handle worry, anxiety, or fear is huge. Now, courage is one of the lesser spoken about virtues in the Christian life, but when you think about it, it's absolutely essential to every virtue being consistently and faithfully worked out. So C.S. Lewis puts it like this. He says, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point, which means at the point of highest reality, a chastity or an honesty or a mercy which yields to danger will be chaste or honest or merciful only on conditions, when there's no danger. Pilate was merciful until it became risky. So what he's saying is you can have all these other virtues and be fine when life is comfortable and easy, but there will come a time when those virtues are tested. And if you're going to continue expressing them, you're going to have courage, have to have courage to press through and put up with the cost of continuing to express those virtues. So it's not often we speak about courage per se. But it's essential to all the other virtues. You will need courage and you will need to learn how to effectively wrestle with fear and worry and anxiety if you are to flourish into everything that Christ has for you. You will need courage to be faithful to your convictions because it is easy to be faithful in certain conditions, is it not? Many of us, our workplaces have been a little room or a little office where we have no colleagues and nothing else to bother us but Hopefully, over the coming months, we will be getting into environments where we have more colleagues around, or we will be meeting up with family, who 99% are lovely, but there are certain family members who push certain buttons in our lives. Would you agree? Or you push certain of their buttons. And some virtues, like patience, have been easy, while you've been more isolated, maybe. Or might be the opposite. But the more we interact with people and with life, our virtues like those will be tested. Personally, I think in my experience, fear, worry, anxiety are the most common things that stop believers from flourishing and enjoying the fullness of life that Christ has for them. They steal 
They kill, they destroy, they reduce your vibrancy and they reduce your faith. And it can very easily cause you to live in a place of just mediocrity in the things of God because it's too fearful to go again because we've been hurt. Or it's too worrying to risk that because I might get hurt again. And often how we handle those things will affect a lot about how we are fruitful in our Christian walk. The Bible is full of commands to not fear, full of reasons and encouragements to be bold and have courage because it is needed. Christians are said to be aliens in this world, strangers and aliens, and that takes a courage to live out that. Some of you will know that in a natural way from having moved from one place to another. Just a change of culture is a huge challenge for some of us. And many people here today or on watching online We've been held back by fear, many of us. And if some of us, things come to mind immediately. But for others of us, we can look back and see how we were for many years or if we're not being now. Some of us have got medical news and we don't know what the future holds. And we're held back <coughs> by that and it's crippling us. Some of us, marriage is not going well and you wonder what family is going to be like in the future. For some of us, it's commitment. Maybe we fear committing and being hurt again or being stung again. Maybe you're wrestling with some form of dysphoria and you think, how do I follow Christ and wrestle with this? What does he say about it? So courage is hugely important to every aspect of our lives. So we're going to dive into Judges chapter 6 and we're going to look at the story of Gideon, a man who was not (laughs) very courageous, a man who seemed to be very timid and a man who seemed to be very fearful. So let's pray and then we will dive in. Lord Jesus, we thank you. That on this Easter Sunday, we get to celebrate a God who showed courage. Jesus, even you asked the Father to take the cup of suffering from you, but not his will, but yours. Not your will, but his be done. And you embraced suffering on our behalf. The courageous one who now rules and reigns supreme. And we ask now tangibly now that you would come and help us into freedom that we would be those who would know the courage more and more to follow and serve you faithfully into fruitfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to pick it up in Judges chapter 6. Last week we looked at the, the setting. The people of God are hiding away. The Midianites are oppressing them. They're in caves. They've um, cried out to God in half-hearted repentance, and God sends a prophet or a sermon before salvation to help them see the depths of their sin. But even in the midst of that, God is already working to save them and to raise up another deliverer. So Judges chapter 6, verse 11 to 12, we read this. The angel of the Lord came, and he sat under the oak that was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, valiant Warrior. So picture this, a wine press is often underground or low set, and it's a terrible place to thresh wheat, where you throw it up so the wind blows away the light bits of the wheat and the heavy stuff sets. If you're in a wine press, doing that, there's not much wind, is there? So why is Gideon doing it in this wine press? It's because he's hiding, because he's afraid. He's afraid that the Midianites would come and steal what he's got. Maybe they were afraid that they would attack him himself. The picture here, the author is deliberately painting a picture to declare, as one preacher puts it, this is no Jack Bauer, okay, or no Nicolas Cage, or no Chuck Norris, or no insert hero who always wins and no matter what happens to him, he survives. This is no superhero. This is someone who is very timid and very scared. And then this angel appears to this person who's hiding away and says, Valiant warrior. Now, if this was a stage play, this is the point where everyone laughs, okay? Or if it's like a, someone holds up a sign saying applause, okay? Can you, let me, I'll hold up a sign. You applaud. Applaud mockingly. There you go. The angel comes on and says, Valiant warrior. I, I don't know how he, the angel said it. Maybe his big booming voice, Valiant warrior. Or maybe it's just a very normal voice. But the angel comes in and calls this person hiding away. Valiant warrior. Now, if you were any doubt as to whether Gideon was timid or fearful, we'll read on. Gideon asks two questions in response to this angel coming and saying, you're a, you're a mighty warrior. Question number one, if the Lord is with us, why has this happened? Now, we started to look at this last week a little bit. It's not because the Lord has gone away. It's because the people have rebelled against him. 
But then the second question, where are all the wonders that our fathers told us about? God, you used to move in power. God, we heard how you parted the sea. God, we heard how you overcame Pharaoh, how you reversed a lot of the things of nature and showed that you were the God over all creation. God, you've done these amazing things. Why are you not moving in our day? And so the angel of the Lord or the Lord said, it seems that this is what theologians call the Christophany. Okay, which is a pre-incarnate coming as a man appearance of Jesus. Okay, so it seems that frequently Jesus would come and would be called the Lord or the angel of the Lord. And this seems to be one of those appearances where Jesus has always been working throughout history to save and redeem people. It's a beautiful picture. But the angel comes in chapter 6 verse 14 and says this. The Lord turned to him, and this is the angel or the Lord's answer to Gideon saying, where are the mighty works of God in our generation? The Lord turns to him and says, go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. Interestingly, Gideon, just picture this, Gideon's asking, where are the works of God in our generation? Now, firstly, he's speaking to an angel (laughs) or the Lord. You would think like, that's a a pretty impressive work of God in our generation. I mean, maybe it it was seemingly more common in those days. But if an angel's sitting in front of you having a conversation with you or the Lord, you're probably not saying, where's God working in our world today? But secondly, look at the answer that the angel gives to Gideon. He basically says to Gideon, as Gideon says, where are you working in our generation? He basically says to Gideon, it's you, son. You're up. (laughs) Doesn't he? He says, go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. The answer to the question is, you are up. You go for it. God often uses us as the very answer to the cry of our hearts. So we think, God, can you move and do that and do that? And God says, yes, but I'm going to use you (laughs) often, which is why we have the burden in the first place to pray. God can move sovereignly elsewhere, and prayer moves the hand of God, absolutely. But often when we're praying for something to happen, God says, you're the solution. Let me fill you with the Spirit. Let me give you boldness. Let me give you courage. Let me give you faith. Let me give you wisdom. Let me go give you discernment. You go and do it. But Gideon is not ready. He's timid, he's fearful, he's not courageous, and he responds with all the excuses and all the reasons and all the common sense that he can to say, it's not meant to be me, verse 15 and 16. He said to him, please, Lord, (laughs) please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? My family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's family. So if you're in any doubt about him, thinking, I I can't do this, I want to hide away. I'm weak, I'm timid, I'm hesitant, I'm hiding. I mean, the best I can do, O Lord, is crawl out of my cave, my hole in the ground, and thresh some wheat quietly in the hope that I won't get caught. I am not your man. (laughs) Do a mighty work, God, but (laughs) count me out from actually doing it. And God responds in verse 15 and 16 and says, but I will be with you. The Lord said to him, you will strike down Midian (laughs) as if it were one man. But I will be with you. But I will be with you. But I will be with you. But I'll be with you. That is the bedrock for all courage. God being with you. God being for you. But looking a bit more specifically, our first point, courage comes from calling. Can you say calling? So God called Gideon, a mighty warrior, before he was clearly a mighty warrior. God speaks identity into him. God calls what will be what is. He wasn't called because he was courageous. He became, as we'll see, even little by little, he became courageous because God had called him. God had spoken into him. God had breathed life into him. As a young man, I was once told, God doesn't call call the qualified He qualifies the called. And that's been very true and something I've held on to. God doesn't wait until you are always ready. Doesn't mean he doesn't do any work in you. But often he's not looking for the finished product to then use because then you're going to think I've made it. God often uses people way before they feel qualified and he calls them to and he gives them the grace that they need. It is not our adequacy that gives us courage. It's our inadequacy that is met with God's mighty strength. God calls you a saint, not a sinner. If you're a Christian, you are a saint who sometimes sins. It's an important 
identity mark. You are no longer a sinner who sometimes does saintly things. That's how you might describe yourself by observing your life. <laughs> but God says you are a saint. You are a new creation. No more in condemnation. God speaks. He calls identity into He says, you are no longer a slave to sin. You're now a slave to righteousness. You're not a child of darkness. You're now a child of light. You are a new creation, a resurrected one, a friend of God, not just a, a servant, although we serve God. And friends know <laughs> what's going on with God. He's one who can hear His voice. Jesus says elsewhere, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. You can know God. This is the new identity. God speaks into us things that we think, really, you think that of me? God's calling us into something that he sees that he has made us in Christ. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Our courage to fight sin and to resist temptation and to believe for victory and freedom comes from God's calling and his spoken identity over us. You should spend way more time telling God what he said is true of you, than telling him what you think is true of you. <laughs> you want God's thought and defining calling on your life. And calling can be very broad. What God calls you into, I mean, God's called us to enough in here to keep you busy every day. So if you think, what God's called me to, well, open your Bible and you'll be busy for the rest of your life. But God does also specifically call us to certain things as well. He knows that you're the weakest, the smallest, and the outsider. And that's not dismissing your strengths and abilities that God's given you. And some of us have been birthed with some more naturally in some ways than others. It's just saying that all of that counts for nothing ultimately in the kingdom of heaven unless it's accompanied by the purpose and the calling and the power of God. God has used Moses <laughs> to declare his messages. Moses complained that he wasn't a narrator. God called Abraham the father of many people when he was biologically sterile. God speaks into being that which is not, and that's where we get our courage. Romans 4 verse 17 says, Faith is believing God when he calls into existence the things that do not exist. <laughs> when God calls it into existence, when we think it's not even there, and we believe in that is faith. This Easter, he has risen from the grave, and he has given you a new name, and he has called you when you were dead in your sin, and he has made you alive, and now he calls you a valiant warrior, because you are indwelt by him. And the Holy Spirit. This is the Lord speaking to Gideon. You and I, if we're believers, we now have that Lord, this mighty angel in us. Dwelling in us, choosing to make us his habitation. So the question is, will you believe him? What God speaks over your life. Will you believe him? Satan is the one who starts with you and what you've done. And he defines you by that. So you think, how do I know whether these are God's thoughts or my thoughts? Satan starts with you and what you have done. And often he whispers, you're a failure, you're a coward, you're a reject. And you know what? Sometimes he uses true facts, true natural facts to get us to believe him. He's called the accuser of the brethren. Day and night, he's accusing us, he's accusing us. God says, my beloved, righteous, saint, mighty man of valor, and you say, but God, I'm, I'm, I'm none of those. And God says, you will be. You are in my eyes. And here's how you tell the difference between the Holy Spirit's voice and Satan. Both will talk about your sin. And it's easy to conf confuse them. But this is how you tell. Satan starts with you and what you've done, and he beats you up for it. <laughs> the Holy Spirit starts with the declaration of God, what he's done, and what he's making you in Christ. It's not that what we do doesn't matter. It's if you're in Christ... You have a new identity and a new calling. Courage comes from that calling. But you say, God has called me, but I need more training, and I need more of this, and I need more of that. I mean, we've all been there, haven't we? I know God's put something on my heart, apart from like including all the stuff in the Bible. God's put something on my heart, but, but I'll wait. <laughs> I know you've called me to it, but God, I'm going to wait until something's in place. I'm going to wait until the environment's better. I'm going to wait until I feel totally and fully equipped. I mean, now, some waiting is good to... <laughs> depending on what you're doing. But often we're waiting for the perfect scenario before we step out in courage. But secondly, courage starts with what you have and where you are. Because we can think about courage as these mighty acts. And this is where the story of Gideon, but we'll see that it doesn't quite start like that. We think he's going to defeat an army. That's a mighty act. You know, praying for someone to be healed and their arm growing, that's a mighty act. They, they are mighty acts, but often courage is displayed in hidden, secret, small things 
first. Judges 6, verse 14, the angel turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. Gideon was asking where this activity was. And God said, you are it. You need to go now. So I just want to say, I think courage starts with faithfulness in the little things. Luke 16 says, if you're faithful with a little, if you're faithful with a natural, and if you're faithful with another man's, God will entrust you with more. And it's a spiritual principle. If you're faithful with small, it grows. <laughs> and you get more. If you're faithful with your giving, if you're faithful in your prayer, if you're faithful in your, your, your purity and your faithfulness, or whatever it might be, it grows. It develops your character and you grow. Courage starts with what you have and where you are. Faithfulness with the battles of the mind. Faithfulness to share your faith with people who might reject you or joke about you. Faithfulness with little battles to stand up for what you think is right and risk mockery. To not engage in the family WhatsApp banter that's all pulling each other down. We've all got those WhatsApp groups, haven't we? You're like, do I engage with this banter or not? <laughs> How far do I, do I go? I want to be part of the family so I can be light. But ooh, if I don't say something, people will notice. <coughs> Faithfulness to the secret courage to not dwell on our thoughts, to get out of that situation, to not respond to that unkindness or to change a relationship. Some of those courageous battles no one will ever know about and no one will ever see, but your Father in heaven does. And that's where courage starts. No act of courage is insignificant. And the story goes on, and God first called Gideon to tear down what belonged to his father. So we're anticipating that God would say to Gideon, and he does, and we get there, defeat the Midianites. But first God calls him to, in his own house, in his father's house, tear down altars to Baal. Okay? So you think, okay, we know the story. Gideon is going to be this great victor. So, I mean, tearing down your altars in your backyard isn't a big deal. Come on, Gideon, you can do it. Well, verse 27, Gideon took 10 of his male servants and did as the Lord told him. Hurrah! Can you say hurrah? But because he was too afraid, hold on, that doesn't add up, of his father's family and the men of the city to do it in the daytime, he did it at night. <laughs> you think, okay, he did it, but I mean, he kind of like did it sneakily. Does that count? <laughs> Sometimes when you dwell in scripture, you think, what's going on? What's the author trying to say? So is this a plus for Gideon or is this a minus? What, what do you think? You think, is this a commendable thing or, or not? Well, at the end of the day, he did it. And that ultimately is what really counts. It's not the bravado. It's the obedience that really counts. And that is a sign of courage. Jesus in Matthew 21 tells a parable of a father who said to his sons, go and work in my vineyard, two sons. One son says, of course I will, dad. I'm going. I'm, I'm amazing. I, I have all these abilities in me. I'll go and do it. And the other son says, I don't know how he said it, but I can remember, I don't want to. And he walks away. The first son, who was like, yes, I will do it, didn't actually do it. And the other son, who said, no, I can't imagine what happened. Maybe he walked away and thought, oh, I really have to do this. I want to throw a sulk, but I know it's right, and I want to ultimately honor my father. I'll go and do it. And Jesus says, which one did the will of the father? It's not the one who had the showy, I'm amazing, look at me, Christianity. It was the person who ultimately had the courage to obey, despite every inkling in them, maybe to not do so. And he was commended. If you're waiting on God to give you everything you need, I don't think you will ever get there. We say, God, show me the provision and I'll obey. God says, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you obey and I will show you the provision. You get out the boat and walk, and then I'll help you walk on water. You're not going to walk on water by staying in the boat. We have people, including me at times, waiting to obey God, to go and speak, to go on a mission, to make a sacrifice, saying, God, show me how this will work out, and I will do it. <laughs> have you ever wanted to know that? God, if I make this decision, <laughs> please show me how it will work out, then I will do it. If I could ask God for one gift, it would be the foresight of hindsight, I think. I think that would be the gift. I mean, I know I meant to say wisdom because Solomon asked for that and he was commended. But I think I would ask for foresight of hindsight. So hindsight is beautiful, isn't it? We can look back and think, if I had known that, I wouldn't have done that or I would have done it earlier. Imagine you could know that in advance, how everything's going to pan out. 
That's the gift that I would ask. But often God says, wrong order. You step out, you go, and then I'll show you. His word is a lamp to your feet. (laughs) It's not like this big light. You know, sometimes God brings clarity, hallelujah, and faith. But often it's just the next step. And we're called to obey with courage. Start where you are and with what you have. Trusting God as you go. And so if courage is calling, God's called you to, and starting with what you have, which develops your courage. God, you've said this, I'll do it. Small faith, and you develop courage, and you develop awareness of how God works. That, That will build courage in you. But all of this comes together on Easter, because ultimately courage comes from Christ in you. And if Christ is in you, this is the third point, if Christ is in you, the voice of the Father and the security you have as a son. It's like a down, through the Holy Spirit, Christ in you through the Holy Spirit is a down payment. It's a deposit of heaven, if you like. And the worst that can happen to you in terms of death as a Christian is that it is a change of address. Paul was able to say, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. In the West especially, very few Christians see death as gain. Because life is quite comfortable. And we're more thoughtful of what we will miss. Now that is real and it is heartbreaking and it is painful. But we don't dwell on what we will gain in Christ. I saw a comment, I think it was a tweet this week, and someone said, you don't have to compromise because you don't have to survive. I thought, well, it's a bit harsh. But it's true, isn't it? You don't have to compromise because for us, and now many of us will never be in any situation like that, the death is not the end. The doorway to Christ is going to be with him for eternity. But to live is Christ. So we're alive and we're serving Jesus. But courage comes from Christ in you because once he dwells in you through his Holy Spirit, there's an affirmation, there's a security. There's a, I just know no matter what, I am God's and he is mine. I remember I used to work in a boarding school as a boarding master. And I would have endless late night discussions with this other boarding master whose door poster was, God is dead, Nietzsche, you know. And, and we used to talk, and I, I would try to get into apologetics about creation and first causes. And, and then after a while, just like, I threw my hands up and I said, Simon, I love Jesus. I know he's real, and I want you to know him too. And what I was saying is, I just know that I know that I know because God is in me. And that made more impact than every other like, apologetic discussion I had. And that has its place, and it's hugely important. But no matter what happens, I know God. He lives in me. Do you know that? That's the glory of Easter Sunday today. It's not just the thing, did he, didn't he? That's yesterday. Saturday is a day of waiting, of hoping, of pain, of anxiety, of disappointment, of wondering, will he, won't he, of will we fools? No, no, no. Easter Sunday is he's alive and well. Hallelujah. He's risen from the tomb, and I get to be with him forever. And no matter how hard that decision is, Through the courage of Christ in me, I can do it and know his affirmation and his love and his approval and his acceptance and his power in me and through me. He didn't hide in a wine press from the enemy, but he walked to the cross and willingly was carried to the grave so that you and I would never have to bear the weight of our Sin And he rose again, pouring out the Spirit into the hearts of believers, bringing assurance with them that God is with them. And the worst that can happen is death as a change of address. He ascended into heaven, showing the inheritance of all the saints. So now, not only do we know it internally, but we can look to Christ. He was the firstborn, going ahead of us, showing us what will be. He is now dwelling with the Father in the resurrected body that you and I will one day have. Hallelujah. And he appeared to many to demonstrate, and that is the hope that we have. He is the one who said in John chapter 11, verse 25 to 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is to say, do you believe that? If you're not a Christian, do you believe that? You can live and never die if Christ is in you. In eternity with him, free from sin, just to serve by Christ on the cross if you call out to him. If you're a Christian, do you believe that? One of the biggest lessons I'm learning in Judges, and I'm learning to ask this question is, what do I believe that I'm not living vibrantly with in my heart? 
because that's repeatedly their problem, is they forgot, not mentally, they had the memory, but they forgot to live and dwell and foster a place of faith. In Hebrews, it also says the people received the word, but they didn't mix it with faith, so it was futile to them. You know, you can know every bit of doctrine in the world, and it can be futile to you if it's not alive in your heart, and you're living by faith in it. And Easter says that you can do that. (laughs) Jesus obeyed the Father through the most bizarre, most ridiculous way, we think. And yet, look, you and I have hope today because he was courageous enough to obey the Father. And you and I have this Christ in us. So as we come to an end, in a bit, we're going to watch a video. It's a worship video. And I just want you to, during the video, I want you to grab communion. If you're watching online, maybe get it in the lounge. This is for Christians. If you'd call yourself a Christian, if you're watching online or you're here and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, this is especially for believers because it is us declaring that Christ has died for us and we're remembering that sacrifice. But as 1 Corinthians says, we're also proclaiming his death until he comes again. Again, Because guess what? He's not dead anymore. Hallelujah. But if you aren't a believer today, if you were to bow the knee to Jesus, surrender your life to him, submit to him, ask him to forgive you of your sins, entrust your life to him and follow him, you can take this for the very first time. And we'd love to pray with you, send a comment online or chat to us here if that's you. So I just want you to get you this ready. While we watch this worship video, I just want you to be still and behold Jesus and have the bread and the wine as you feel right. And then the worship team will lead us in response at the end. But let me pray before we do that. Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you that you showed the greatest courage any man would ever show in bearing the wrath for our sin. We thank you, Jesus, that you were forsaken that we might never be and that you have won the greatest victory. Thank you, you went in obedience and the strength of the Father's calling over your life. And we are the fruit of that. And we honor you and we behold you today. And we invite you, just where you are, and I just deliberately ask Jesus to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, fill us with your Spirit. Come and circumcise our hearts afresh. Come and clothe us with power from on high as we behold the risen, victorious Lamb of God. Worthy, worthy, we're the one who is the Lion of Judah. If you're not a Christian, we'd love to pray with you. Please get in contact with us. Let's watch the video together. Oh. 